So here are the three modules that are, um, well, I think of more behavioral. The first one is increasing pleasant, non-harmful activities. This is a standard part of treatment for depression. It's part of Beck's uh, treatment, cognitive therapy. It's part of Lewin, it's a big part of Lewinson's treatment and Greg Clark's treatment. And it also helps to challenge the belief that the person can no longer enjoy things. So in the sequence in which this is usually done, it's done after mood monitoring and goal setting, so it's the third tool in the backpack, okay? So let's do this. Um, I'm going to, um, I have the manual on my own computer here. I'm going to pull up a page on it. Okay, so I'm going to ask somebody to do this with me in a role play, and, um, and then we will do it among ourselves so you get the hang of this. The basic idea is to generate a list of activities that the adolescent either likes to do or would like to do or used to like to do, okay? And then to obtain a baseline of how often they're doing them recently, and then select two or three of them to try to increase over the next week and while doing that, to continue to rate their mood every day. So they see the connection between activities and mood. All right, now here are the guidelines. I'm mentioning this because I'm sure to forget them in the role play. Guidelines, choose activities you enjoy. Choose activities that are active, not passive. Sleep does not count as a pleasant activity. <laughs> Choose activities that are not expensive, such as, you know, you know those ridiculous television ads that come on at Christmas where you're supposed to buy your wife a Lexus? I mean, give me a break. I saw a great cartoon on that where the, uh, the guy walks outside with his wife um, on Christmas and, he's, and the car's got the ribbon on top of it and he says, Merry Christmas, honey. It's a, it's a great event. I washed your car for you. <laughs> anyway, choose activities that are not expensive. Choose activities that do not harm anyone, get you into trouble, or harm your body. Marijuana is not one of the uh, approved, it's not on the approved list for pleasant activities. Except in <laughs> California and parts of Colorado. Choose activities that you can do often without the cooperation of many other people. So if it's a kid who likes to play sports, uh, a, a feasible activity is something that involves two or three other people maybe, but not 18 people playing a full game of baseball. I mean, that's, you can't arrange that, okay? So enjoyable, active, inexpensive, not harmful, and not requiring the cooperation of many people. Those are the guidelines. And I'll see if I can remember them. Okay, so, um, so I need another volunteer to do a role play with me, please. Okay, Beatrice, so we've been working together for several weeks now, and you already got the idea about how to pay attention to your mood and how to set goals and and uh, I want to go to the third skill now, the third tool in your backpack, which is called increasing pleasant activities, okay? The reason we do this is because it's a really powerful way to overcome depression. It's also pretty, pretty s simple, although sometimes challenging. So what I'd like to do um, is... Um, is go through with you some things that you might find enjoyable that will help you to get a little more active and start to feel better. You'll notice that as you do these pleasant activities, your mood will start to improve, okay? So you, can you tell me, just sort of at the beginning, um, let's just brainstorm for a while and tell me what kinds of things you might like to do or you used to like to do, and make them, make them uh, 
things that don't involve a lot of other people's cooperation and are, are not harmful in any way. Okay. I like swimming. Swimming, okay, good. Um, dancing. Dancing, okay. Swimming, dancing. Else. Anything else? <laughs> I can give you some, uh, some ideas to think about. Reading. Okay. Reading? Reading? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any uh, outdoor activities? Mm. I can think of any. Okay. It about, has to, maybe it has to do with the camera. Okay. <laughs> about anything involving music? Do you like music at all? Yes. What do you but, like about music? Do you like to listen to it or play it or, or what? I just like music that I can dance. Music to dance to? Yeah, to dance to. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, do you like writing or poetry nope. or anything like that? Nope. Okay. How about um, talking to people on the phone or on, on uh, Facebook? No. <laughs> no, you don't like that? No. Mm -mm. Okay. How about going places with your friends? Yes. Like that. Where do you mm -hmm. like to go? Uh, shopping. Oh, I forgot that one. Shopping. Oh, shopping. yes. Okay. Shopping. <laughs> Mucho. Mucho. Okay. okay. Um, uh, nature. I nature. Love, okay. I love nature. What do you like about nature? Um, just to see maybe flowers. Uh, okay. Animals. Uh, Dear. Is there a place you can go for that, or do you do that? Yes. Home yes, I can think of a place where place I can do okay. that. I love to just lay at the beach and read a good book. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have a lot of things you'd like to do, it sounds like. Yeah, now, yeah, okay. now I can think of them. So I've already got about eight things written down swimming, <laughs> dancing, reading. Listening to music to dance to, going places with friends, shopping, uh, going out to nature to see animals, <coughs> going to the beach. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just a minute. That's just, that's enough. You know, I mean, I don't. You don't need to go forever. I mean, <laughs> eight things is a lot. You know, it's going to be hard for a lot of depressed kids to come up with more than two or three. Okay. So this is good. So we'll go with this. Now. But you were pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, that you have to push it, yeah. But I'm just saying I'm not going to push it anymore because I'm going to okay. focus now. So after the, after the generating, I want to focus. Okay. Now, um, if, how many times in the last week, in the last week, how many times have you gone swimming? No. No. Okay. Dancing? No. No. Reading? None. Um, have you done any shopping in the last week? Yes. Okay, how many times? <laughs> I thought maybe. <laughs> how many times? In a week? Yeah, in a week. How many times a day? Your cup. No, but I'm depressed. So. A couple. <laughs> a couple times. A couple times. Right. If I'm depressed, I go shopping. Oh, okay. All right. Um, how about going places with friends? Have you done that enough? Nope. Okay. How about going out to nature to look at trees? And um, animals? it's too cold in Connecticut. We're very nice. Oh, you're very nice. Okay. You should go to Miami. I know. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I guess you haven't been to the beach in the last week. Right? Nope. Okay. All right. So, oh, and how about listening to music? Have you done that at all? No. Oh, yes, yes. How many, how about how many times? Mm, maybe three times in the car while I'm driving. Okay, good. All right. Now I'm going to just talk to the group for a minute. You take your hand out and you look on the last page called Pleasant Activities, Increasing Pleasant Activities. <coughs> do 
you would write down along the left-hand column those activities that we just went over with Beatrice. Okay, and she had eight of them so far. And then um, in the next, well, actually, I did this a little differently. I asked her how many times in the last week she, she's done them. You could, you could break it down the way it is on the form. Um, how many times have you done them in the last three days? That's the way this was written. You have to get some kind of a baseline that you want to improve on. Okay? So if you can get the last week, that's easier because then you're going to have a whole week for her to work on. All right. Now, so now we got the activities. Now, I wanted to see if you could uh, maybe pick two of these activities or maybe three of them that, that you would like to increase in the next week. Because really, most of them you haven't done in the past week. Mm -hmm. So even doing them once or twice would be a significant increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me read them to you again and see if any of these you might be able to or interested in doing, all right? Swimming, dancing, reading, uh, listening to music, although you did that a few times. Going places with friends, maybe shopping, although we have to talk about that a little. Uh, nature, or going to the beach. That's, well, going to the beach you probably can't do. Which of the other ones might you like to do during the week? I'd like to go back to swimming. Swimming, okay. Can you pick another one to try to do? I think um, getting back, you know, talking to my friends, to friends going out okay. with them. All right, good. So let's just stick with those two for a minute. Uh, if you think about the week coming up, how many times do you think you I guess I kind of shouting. If you think about the week coming up, how many times might you be able to go swimming? And how many times would you like to go swimming? I'd like to go at least three times a week. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's, is that possible? That you get, get there three times? Okay. Where would you go? Um, LA Fitness. LA Fitness, okay. Okay. And do you have a way to get there? Okay. How, how would you get there? Like that. Okay, good. Okay. And then, so let's make that a goal, that you will try to go swimming three times a week at LA Fitness. All right? What time of day would you go? Yeah, after school. After school. Okay. Okay. Now, the second thing you said you'd like to increase is going places with friends. Uh, tell me what you might... What might you do that would fit into that category? Um, I will go to them, with them, to the mall. Okay. <laughs> Listening with the third ear here. Okay. I think I'm giving too much information today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, um, when you go to the mall with your friends, uh, how much money do you spend? <laughs> Let's get down to I bread. charge. You charge it. <laughs> okay. So how much do you charge? I don't know. Ask my dad. Ah, uh, okay. I just, I just don't want to set you up to do something that's going to get you in trouble or cost a lot of money. Okay. Would you be able to go, well, this might be hard, would you go to the mall and not spend too much money? Well, I try. Try. I'll try. Okay. So, so I'm going to be meeting with your dad uh, later this week, so I'll see what he thinks about this too. I guess that would be <laughs> that would be one way to do it. All right, but if you went to the, you haven't gone anywhere with your friends in the last week, so even if you just went once, it would be an increase. Yeah. All right. So can you try to do that once? What's the name of the mall? Uh, yep. Okay. Which one do you want to try? Trumbull. Trumbull? All right. Or what, what's another one? Trumbull, the um, town center. Town center? Okay. And how would you get to the mall? Like that. He would take you. Okay. He's key in this whole thing, it sounds like. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so, so, so you're, it, it sounds like the two things that you would like to do, and that would be in a big improvement, would be to go swimming three times at LA Fitness and to go to the mall once with your friends. And your dad, you think your dad could take you to these things? Okay. All right, so basically that's what I'm going to ask you to do this week. I'm going to just ask you to go and do these pleasant activities. And on this form where, I've, where I have uh, written them, allegedly written them, um, I want you to say that you look at this as today. Number one day is today. And we got seven days till we meet again. Okay, we're, we'll meet next week at the same time. And just check each time, <clears throat> excuse me, for each day that you do these things, put a check mark in the box for that day, okay? And I would also like you to pay attention to the way you feel when you're doing them so we can talk about that and see if they help you feel better, all right? Okay, thank you. There you go, very good. Okay. All right, so questions about this? Comments? It would be difficult if the um, adults and does not come up with many um, pleasant activities that that are that are doable, that are simple and doable, and then generating those activity uh, that would be uh, something that I was I was wondering how to go about that. Yeah, that's the most common problem in doing this is that they don't come up with any, or they come up with ones that are either illegal or, you know cost a fortune. So this is what's in the manual. I had this up so I could look at it while I was doing it to help me generate ideas. So I was asking them about different categories. I was asking Beatrice about different categories of activities. And sometimes that's enough. Now, if it's not enough, there are, um, there are a couple of questionnaires that you can use that are actually just lists of pleasant activities. And you can hand them to the kids and ask them to take a look at them and fill them out. One of them is very long. The Lewinson one is really long. It's enormous. But there's also a short form for adolescents that has about maybe 12 or 20 items. There's a book out there um, that, that has a lot of things that, that I think we could use that are not necessarily written for adolescents, but you can certainly bring it on down. That's the Depression Workbook. And it has that list you're talking about, a full page of different activities to think about. So the, those kinds of things help people to, uh, they help people to think about uh, things they may have forgotten about or, 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 or even lost interest in. Uh, so that is what I would do next. If, I, if this didn't work, I would go to one of those, okay? I might also ask the parents for input about things that their teenager used to like uh, before they got depressed. Okay. All right, so what I'd like you to do for, okay. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking of like different challenges for that too, because, well. <laughs> if you're dealing with a child who's also having behavioral issues, you know, at home, and there's that conflict at home, they could come up with some activities but you're gonna get resistance from the parents because they're not feeling that they've earned those activities. And so, you know, again, you come to that bind where, I mean, it, it makes sense too, you know, my child isn't misbehaving, he's being rude, he's talking back, he's not following directions, how am I gonna let them go to the movies Friday? You know, that doesn't make sense either. So, like, how would you work around that if that there, you know, because then there's also that manipulative behavior of children too, where they're going to point out those activities that they want to do that their parents aren't allowing them to do. They're not going to, you know, highlight the phone calls or, you know, the TV time or, or things like that that might be more amenable. Okay, so this is a good question that comes up uh, in practice a lot where you have kids that are in conflict with their parents or they're oppositional or something and they try to use this in context of that conflict. So, um, and I have been faked out on that. I mean, I've gotten caught in real binds where, you know, I had one, one kid that wanted to go to the state fair and, you know, wanted to go with certain friends at a certain time and, 
you know, his parents didn't want him driving at all and so forth. So that was kind of a bust. But, um, but if, I, if I catch on to what's gone, uh, going on, I would try to not, uh, not go along with those activities in the first session. I would, I would try to pick things that are not uh, going to raise conflict with the parents. And I, I would say that, um, you know, once I became aware of it, I would say that out loud, you know, that I, I would like you to pick things that are not going to contribute to conflict between you and your parents. The purpose of this is to help you rekindle your ability to enjoy things. And if we get caught up in a big battle between you and your parents, then it's not going to be very enjoyable. And you might, you might get some enjoyment out of, you know, giving them a hard time, but it's not really going to help your mood very much. So let's try to pick things that are not going to be a source of further uh, conflict between you and your parents. And that's going to cost me some options. It really is. But I, wouldn't, I, w I would rather do that at the beginning. But, but let's, not, let's not sack the parents there. They need to know uh, beforehand in a psychoeducation piece, and I get this a lot with some of the ADHD kids, where they're having some struggles at school, and the parents are taking away the activities where they actually feel good about themselves and making them do more of the activities where they don't do more study, more homework, more of this, more. These kids, if, in general, we're talking about depression here today. So we need to discuss that with the parents that their methods of behavior management can't really be right now. Let's take away all the fun out of their life. Um, the, the sequencing here would be that you would have already had or you will shortly have had the session with the parents about the behavioral skills so that you know they know what you're trying to do. Um, now if you've had it before if you've had it before this that's better because then you're less likely to get caught up in it. Um, there is a, I remember very clearly one kid that I saw years ago who had been grounded for like six months. I mean, if that's all the father could think of was to ground him. And, and so he was grounded and he was hanging around the house and he was, you know, pretty blue. He was also quite oppositional. And that will make the treatment harder. You, you, you can look at the data. The outcome for the comorbid kids is not as good as it is for the ones that are just depressed. But, you know, there's a lot of bigger group that has comorbidity. So, so I think that's true, that you've got to um, help the parents not to be punitive in their, in their discipline and help them to understand that a big part of getting out of the depression is rekindling the ability to enjoy things and that they're going to have to help you with that. Um, at the same time, you don't let the kid get you in a trap where it's you and the kid against the parents. That, that's, a, that's, no, that's a no starter, non starter. So, the steps that I went through with Beatrice were brainstorming, using a list of activities, referring to activities you know some kids enjoy. Those are the guidelines that we talked about, these are in the manual. Choose weekly targets, choose two or three to, to work on for a week, take a baseline of the last several days or the last week. Select the number of times the adolescent would like to do the two or three targets. Try to make one target social. Now, she did pick going out with her friends, so I didn't have to encourage her to pick a social target. But if all of their targets are uh, isolated uh, or solitary, then you, you, you try to encourage them to pick at least one thing that involves other people, even if it's just talking on the phone or using uh, social networking or something that involves other people. And then I mentioned the weekly chart, which is in your handouts, and rate their mood daily, okay? You know, on, this, um, on these uh, pleasant activities, a yeah. lot of times that second, the second visit, I plan to see the child alone or the adolescent alone. And the, the, the uh, purpose of that session, the agenda, is, is mostly to learn about their positives. Mm -hmm. And I want to learn about all the skills, all the things they, they do well. Do they right. play a musical instrument? Do they play a sport? Do they right. sing? Are they right. all the, so by the time we get to this part in the agenda, I think I've already got already sort got of it. a background yeah. of what it is they've yeah. done in right. the past. Oh, I used to play baseball, but I don't anymore. Right. And, you know, those, so now when you get to that session, you remember. That's right. You go back to You've already got it. 
That's right. And this, is, this points up the general principle again that you want to do the treatment, but the way you do the treatment depends on what works for you. Okay, so if you're going to do CBT for adolescent depression, what I'm saying is do pleasant activities, increasing pleasant activities. The manual has one way to do it. There's lots of other ways to do it. Don't be constrained by what's in a manual, okay? You got the general idea. That's what you go with. Now, what gets in the way of these things? Um, shoulds, shoulds get in the way. Kids think they should enjoy something, but they really don't, so they get upset about it. They can't get started on it at all. They pick impractical things, or they pick socially isolated things. Um, the biggest problem, the most common problem, and the thing that you really have to help them deal with if they're quite depressed, is that they used to enjoy these things, but they just don't enjoy anything. And so that's when you have to encourage them to do the things even if they don't feel like it, and then look at how they feel later. Okay, And then it might be that they still feel bad later, at which point you go to well, what got in the way of your enjoying this thing? Was it some kind of a thought that got in the way of enjoyment? Was it some kind of anxiety that got in the way? You know, so you figure out what's getting in the way. Uh, you also may need to decide that the person is so depressed that they need weekly activity scheduling on basic things like getting out of bed, brushing their teeth, shaving, you know, going to the mail mailbox, stuff like that, which is in, if you go that way, use the Beck, uh, the book, the Beck book on activity scheduling where he talks about that. It's in the TADS manual too. I don't know if anybody ever used it because most of the kids we saw, you know, they were not that depressed. I mean, they were moderately to severely depressed, but they weren't profoundly immobilized, okay? So I'm not sure if anybody used it, but it's in the manual. So problem solving is a general life skill applicable in situations that would otherwise lead to depression or, or other negative outcomes. It's the fourth tool in the backpack. And the acronym that everybody's got their own acronym for problem solving. Kev, uh, Kevin Stark has three, I think, himself for, for different ages. Um, and we use this one um, called ribeye. And it seems to be pretty easy to remember. I've had kids come back to me way later after treatment ended. You know, they're in college and they're checking in um, who still remember this. So it does seem to facilitate remembering the steps. So the six steps in the acronym that we used were first relax, because you can't, you can't solve a problem when you're all worked up. Second, identify the problem. Third, brainstorm possible solutions. Fourth, evaluate each one, the pros and cons of each possible solution. Fifth, say yes to one, decide on one. I mean, I had to get a Y in there somehow, so. And then the last thing is encourage yourself. This is a little different from some other uh, list of steps that end with evaluate. This one ends with encourage because these are depressed kids, so we want to get them to take credit for having made a decision. So the way this is done in sessions is there's different ways you can do it, but one is to use an example of a problem based on somebody you know, or use letters. I'll, I have some letters in the handouts. Um, or talk about people in the news who are facing a problem and then go through each of the six steps separately and slowly. And then apply the method to a relatively smaller problem of this adolescent, okay? Okay, so uh, here's a story that uh, somebody told me about, and then please read this over, and then we're gonna talk about it and use it as a way of learning how to do problem solving. So here's the, here's the letter. Uh, last Saturday, I was driving my father's car to my job at the video store. I was close to being late for work, so I was going pretty fast. As I turned a corner on a dirt road after leaving my house, the car slid over to the side of the road. 
This is a North Carolina story, so you have to make ad adaptations. For a minute, I got lost. I lost control of the car. It scraped a tree next to the road, but then I got the steering under control. I was able to get back on the road, slow down, and stop. I was pretty shook up. After I stopped, I got out to look at the car. There's a long scratch mark about three inches wide along the passenger side. I didn't see any other damage, so I got back in and drove to work. After my usual shift, I brought the car home. It was 9 p.m. when I got it home, so it was dark. The next day, my dad went on a trip out of town with some of his friends in one of their cars. My dad is coming home in five days. So far, he doesn't know about the scratch. I'm afraid to tell him because he might ground me from driving. I need to drive to get to work and to get to school. Plus, next weekend, I'm supposed to take my girlfriend to a big dance. She's been looking forward to it for weeks. What should I do? Signed. Worried from Wilson. Wilson is in eastern North Carolina. There's a lot of dirt roads there. Okay, that's the pro. So this is what, you know, this is one way to do it. You give them, give them this kind of canned um, situation and then ask them to use the problem-solving steps to deal with the problem that this kid is facing. Okay, so, so go back to the steps, all right? So first you relax. Everybody relaxed? Don't fall asleep, though. Not, not for another 45 minutes. What's the problem? Hmm? Okay. He's afraid he's going to get grounded if they find out. Right. Okay. Any other ways of describing the problem? So he doesn't know what to do about this, right? Because he's afraid that if he tells them, he's going to get grounded, and then various bad things will happen. All right. That's a pretty good identification of the problem. Right? Now, brainstorm. What are some possible things he could do? Take it to the body shop, yes. Don't evaluate that yet. That's just one possible solution. Take it to the body shop. What else? Tell his, father. Tell his father. All right, so we basically so far have five options. Take it to the body shop, tell his father, tell his father along with a plan, tell his mother, don't do anything. Any other options? Okay, lie, right? Yeah, run away. What about if he's a really industrious guy? Fix it, right? Industrious and reasonably skilled. All right, now we're up to eight. That's probably enough. You want to have any more? Huh? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, helping him with the ideas? No, he might just be asking him if there are any other ideas. But the therapist is supposed to help the kid brainstorm, so not evaluate them right away, just list them. Then you go back and evaluate them. Now the reason you do that in depression, it's different from the reason you do it in conduct disorder. The reason you do it in depression is because depressed and suicidal people get constricted and they can't think of things. So you want to loosen them up. Then you're going to tighten them up again. <laughs> but you got to loosen them up first. With the conduct disorder kids, you're going to really emphasize the, the consequences, consequential thinking. Okay? All right, so let's do the consequences. Now, what are the pros and cons of taking it to the body shop? What's good about that? Get it fixed? What's, what's not so good about it? Money. Okay? And he can't even get it fixed on his own, I guess, if he's a minor. Won't be done in time. All right. Right. That's another negative, right? What about telling his father? Just telling his father that he uh, did it. What's the what are the good? What's good about that? Honesty. It'll 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 end quicker. What about anything negative about telling his father? 
Yep, right? Consequences. What about telling his father along with a plan? That's good. That's even better. That's better, right? That's a little better than the last one. All right, how about telling his mother? What's the advantage of telling his mother? She can tell dad. I thought that was lurking in there. Nobody sort of said it, right? <laughs> All right, and she might help pay for it. And we're not doing marital work, so, you know, it's all right. All right. Any negatives about telling his mom? Indirect. So it might be a passive, indirect way, and that might reinforce some of his depressive features. Oh, so he could ask her for help with problem solving. That's another plus. She might get, he might get grounded, too. All right. How about don't do anything? What are the pros and cons of that? It's not going to feel good. It's, not, it's going to get him stuck, right? Negative. And the father will find out anyway. It will delay the negative. Might get to dance in before the proverbial hits the fan, right? That's <laughs> okay. You and you and you learn, right? All right, right. Um, run away. I need positives to running away. Doesn't seem like much. Hey, South Beach. <laughs> okay, now, uh, or fix it yourself. What what are the pros and cons of fixing it himself? Doesn't have the skills or the equipment. And it's deceitful. But if he was able to do it, it might. <laughs> yeah, hey, I mean, he might, he might feel good about this. All right. All right. So now, so far we've done the first uh, four steps, right? Then you have to choose one. Okay, so... How many people would choose taking it to the body shop to get fixed? Nobody. How many people would say, tell his father? Okay. Tell his father with a plan. Okay. Tell his mother. Okay. Don't do anything. Uh, run away. Fix it on your own. So people kind of coalesced around telling his father with a plan or possibly telling his mother, all right? So let's assume that, well, you know, the patient does that. And then you, whoops, and then you encourage him for having gone through the process. Now, this is, this is a canned case. It's not a real situation for this kid. Okay, now, let's talk about uh, challenges in problem solving. One of the challenges in problem solving is, as a therapist, if you get into it, on, not on a canned case, but if you get into it on a real issue for the kid too fast, before they haven't had a chance to vent, they can feel unheard. You know, you don't, you don't understand how hard this is. You don't understand how big this is. You're just trying to resolve it, okay? And this comes up in marital therapy, right? The wife says, you know... I feel really X, Y, and Z, and the father starts, the husband starts problem solving, you know, and the wife doesn't feel heard. I don't know why that example came to mind, but. Um, second problem is, a second problem that comes up with kids is, 
this doesn't come up very often, but it comes up sometimes where people sort of have the attitude that problems shouldn't exist, and so I shouldn't have to deal with this stuff. Uh, third is um, people that can't relax when they're faced with a problem. So you might have to tra train them in relaxation before they can even do problem solving. And the fourth one is identifying the problem can be challenging and it intersects with values. Um, brainstorming, if you do the brainstorming too fast and don't allow for any potentially poor solutions, then you're kind of defeating the purpose of brainstorming. The purpose of brainstorming is not to come up with the perfect solution, it's to come up with all possible solutions. So you're trying to get the person to be more flexible in their thinking, right, and their behavior. This is something that cognitive behavior therapy has in common with psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is designed to make you more flexible by making your unconscious conflicts conf conscious so you can deal with them. Uh, for the evaluating, uh, it's important to go through short-term and long-term pros and cons, especially with kids that are more on the conduct disorder oppositional side of things. They'll gravitate towards these sort of antisocial solutions. And it's important to help them think through the long-term consequences. And then for choosing, you want to reinforce the choice and then plan to follow up to see how it works. Um, now, I've noticed a few things. Uh, this is just my own kind of speculation, but it seems like different aspects of problem solving are important for different disorders. As I mentioned, the kids who are acting out, the ones that have conduct disorder, oppositional disorder, substance abuse, they don't think of consequences, especially long-term consequences. So the most important part of the exercise for them is practicing consequential thinking or long-term thinking. On the other hand, anxious adolescents can be just frozen because they're so afraid of negative consequences. And this comes out when they do the problem solving experience, so then you have to deal with that. Depressed adolescents can be hopeless about it. It doesn't matter what I do, nothing's gonna work, blah, 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 okay? And if you're dealing with that, then you have to try to uh, experiment with it, try something out and see how it works. Try to get them to agree to that. Perfectionistic adolescents, who uh, also can be among the depressed ones, they want the one perfect answer. When you tell them there's no one answer, they don't believe you. They think there is an answer. I mean, there's an answer on all those tests at school. Isn't there an answer here? Right? And suicidal adolescents have great difficulty with brainstorming because they, they can't generate alternatives. They get tunnel vision. Okay. All right, so, so what I would like you to do for a few minutes so that we can uh, kind of uh, solidify this is to practice this with somebody at your table where one of you, maybe you should reverse the roles that you did before and the one who was a therapist become the teenager and vice versa and pick a, pick a problem that the kid brings in but not a huge problem and try to go through the six steps and see how it works and then we can talk about the implementation challenges, okay? Can you do that for a few minutes? Okay, let's talk about what issues came up when you were doing the exercise. What, what did you find uh, either easy about it or difficult about it, or what issues came up with the person who was role-playing the adolescent? Anybody want to start? Um, for this uh, kid was very hard it was like the end of the world you know this is, this is I'm going to lose my friend this is you know she she betrayed her friend she told her not to tell a secret and she was like I told the secret and she's never going to forgive me she's never going to talk to me so that's the anxious adolescent paralyzed by the consequences right so when you find that you 
you're, you can continue the exercise, but it, probably at some point in the treatment, you're going to have to deal with, uh, well, definitely at some point in the treatment, you're going to have to deal with the catastrophizing. That's the cognitive distortion, right? So this exercise, like the, like the increasing pleasant activities, can evoke the cognitions that you're then going to work on more directly, okay? Okay, good. That's a good example. What else did people find happening? As the therapist, she really didn't rush me into the brainstorming. She dealt with the emotions that I was feeling before we could get there. Yeah, that's important and difficult. So one of the, one of the big pitfalls of cognitive behavior therapy is, is to, to focus too much on the techniques and want to get to the technique and leave the person in the dust while you're going over the technique with them. <laughs> So staying with the emotion is very important. Okay. Okay. My client here couldn't make friends. Couldn't make friends. But she didn't seem too depressed because she came up with seven ways to make friends. So. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> I need that list. <laughs> and then we we went back. Well, we started with hello, and eventually later on I had her um, expand on that more than just hello. What else could she say? Okay. But we. We came up with how she would feel about each of these things, and we put pluses and minuses by what might happen. Okay. Um, uh, we ended up with, then we counted the pluses, and we came up with three pluses for joining a club. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and then there were lots of minuses for things like going on the internet and asking mom to invite somebody over. but and going to the mall, but then for joining clubs, she said she was afraid to go alone. So then we came up with finding somebody else that might go with her because maybe somebody else needs a friend. Okay, all right, good. So, so the, the um, idea of putting the pluses and minuses is that's exactly what Greg Clark does in his, in his manual for the Coping with Depression course. And also in our family manual, that's one of the ways to, uh, when you're dealing with if you're doing problem solving with the family, you can get people to put down, you know, how many pluses for each thing and how many minuses for each thing and then kind of look at what has the predominance of the pluses and that's the thing you try to get people to agree on. Okay, so that's a good method. Okay. And there really aren't any negative. I mean, there's nothing, she didn't come up with any alternatives that would be inherently negative, right? Well, I was a little worried about the internet. Okay. She Okay, but it's not a real personal contact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, to yeah. Me, that would be the most negative. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, and, and finding people at the mall, that might be kind of... Oh, that could be risky, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to do that. Okay. All right, how about you guys over here? You got anything that came up? Um, my client had a very strict parent who wouldn't let her go see her friends at all. And her only alternative was to sneak out. And she had been doing that for a while. Um, which the pro of that was that she gets to go out, but the con was it's dangerous and she could get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So we talked about um, maybe she could convince mom to let her invite a friend to the house and she could get to know the friend and then maybe graduate up to going out with the friend if she calls her when she arrives at her destination and mom gets the GPS system on the cell phone and <laughs> all that stuff. Uh, Mom was worried something bad was going to happen. Yeah, so you you run into this um, uh, in 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 families in dangerous neighborhoods, you know, where the it's hard to generate the prob the um, solutions or or also pleasant activities because the parents are genuinely afraid of danger. Uh, of course, it might be a, an anxious mother who's afraid of danger for anxiety reasons, but sometimes in in working with kids, we find that the actual neighborhood is, is a source of danger, and then you have to adjust it accordingly. But it sounds like a great way to do it, to kind of gradually build up the trust by stepwise like that, okay? All right, how about the group over here? Do you have any event, issues that came up? Okay. 
we were we were talking about a solution or not a solution but a situation where um, one girl is is having a difficulty because her friend is upset with her because her friend's ex-boyfriend has now asked her to go out with her and with him rather and now she has to decide what to do and she doesn't want her friend to be mad at her but she feels you know some connection with this guy and and so we were talking about that, but then we kind of veered off a little bit. <laughs> you know, we were talking about what solutions, and they're, they're usually limited with what solutions they'll come up with. But then the other aspect is that, you know, we're also talking about a depression. And depressed kids not only have difficulty problem solving, but they have difficulty making decisions. And so everything is so life impacting. And, it, and even being able to bring it down to, you know, making this seem that it's, it's not a huge decision, it's a minor decision, it's gonna be a challenge. And then having them be able to even see any of the possibilities, because they kind of get stuck in the middle. So one strategy when you, if you do find that the, uh, if you're working on a real problem with the kid and you think, it, you think at the outset that you've picked a moderate problem, but it turns out to be a massive problem is to kind of put it on hold and then pick another problem. Um, so, they, so they get the hang of the method. You know, they get to go through the steps and they succeed in all the steps and then they might be able to apply it to a bigger problem. Also, this reminds me of the overlap between CBT and interpersonal therapy. And this is exactly what you would deal with in interpersonal therapy. The, you know, the role Role transition and dealing with you know an ex-boyfriend, a friend, and a boyfriend, and an ex-boyfriend, and all that stuff that all that stuff that makes me. I had this interview a couple weeks ago with an adolescent girl, and I finally felt like finally I understood the mental life of adolescent girls. I mean, she explained this whole thing about boyfriends, and she was so articulate. And I thought, man, I wish she had met me before I. You know, before my daughter was a teenager, but anyway, it's really, it can get pretty puzzling, um, but that's a good example, very good example. Okay, did you want to? I think this is the most interesting situation that, what's your name? That Diane has, uh, is that um, she's working, or she just was referred a child who is, so depressed, he's like a, a big blank slate that, you know, the, so the, the thing is that we were brainstorming about what his issues might be because he's giving out so little information and, um, it, you know, it's going to be like a big ball, a puzzle ball that... that it's very you, helpful, by the way. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, I guess we all ask questions to find out more about him, but it seems like he's... Um, He's so nonverbal, he's his got very flat affect. He's like a blank, a blank person. No idea, but he does have a couple of possible strengths that his grades are a strength, he, um, but he doesn't talk to anybody, he doesn't interact with anyone. There was a, a conflict five years ago and that was the only like interpersonal activity, that interpersonal situation that he was in in like five years. The last time that he dealt with anyone was over a conflict. And so it's gonna take a lot to unravel this big ball of nothingness, I guess. Um, to find out what his typical day is like, um, to find out more about his family, find out more information about the fights he was in at the beginning of sixth grade. He's now 17 and a sophomore. What type of TV does he enjoy, since that's, his, that's what he does? Um, and to emphasize the fact he's getting all A's and B's in hard subjects. Um, we gave him an interest inventory, so to follow up on that and see if he's been able to do anything with that. And really whether or not he thinks he has a problem. They're very good. They're very good ideas. So that's a good example of consultation, right? 